Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode. I'm really excited about today's guest, Daniel Wren. Today's talk is all about finances, financial literacy, financial planning, retirement. And Daniel, he's he dubs himself as the non-obvious cause of the burnout epidemic in medicine. And I'm really happy to bring him on the show. So Daniel, welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, um, I, like I said, we were talking backstage uh, we speak the same language and the, you're, you're kind of like, like my bread and butter guest. So kind of talk about your story, set the stage, and we'll dive right into the conversation. Yeah. So I I have been in the financial advising business, I guess it's almost 20 years now. And when I started in the uh, industry a while back, um, it was right out of college and I had I, I kind of got into the business with good intentions <laughs> you know i think my my goal was to really i mean help people with money and i think a lot of people in our industry um it's a lot like medicine i mean in, in medicine most of our the physicians we work with have have really good intentions like they want to help the patients i mean and that's the reason they got into medicine and so i was kind of in the same boat like i got into financial advising i'm like well you know i'd love to help people with their money and that's the perfect career to go into out of college. And so that's the route I took. And so fast forward, I got into, you know, the traditional system of, of financial advising and really started to feel the pressure of like productivity and, you know, selling more and hitting all the targets. And, and I quickly realized, I mean, it actually, it took me a little while. I mean, it, unfortunately it took me several years to realize this, but eventually realized that that was the number one was the productivity and the targets and hitting all those metrics and making money. And that, that was above taking the best care of the, the clients. And basically I was becoming like a salesperson that was like kind of disguised as a trusted advisor. And that was, that was like directly conflicting with the reason I got into the business in the first place. I, I love the practice, but I hated the system. And I think, I think that's like, it's so common and the physicians we work with, I think, struggle with this same challenge. Uh, and it, I think a lot of them realize, you know, at that point, I, I realized this, it's like, something's got to change. Like this, this is not what I set out to do. And I hit that brick wall of like, I got to change something. But that's when, like, as soon as you get there, you're like, uh, fear, doubts, like, how can I do this? What? And then you're like finances, what am I going to, how am I going to pay my bills? And fortunately I had like, kind of like the tools, maybe we'll talk about this a little bit more, but like I had like what I would consider like the key tools in place uh, to, to allow me to make a pretty speedy transition. Like I had developed like solid financial literacy and it addressed like the big life questions to help give me direction. And so that was really what gave me the courage to make that big, scary change. And so what I did when you get to that point, when I got to that point, it's like, okay, there's a few options. I can, I can make a big change and go kind of like recreate the practice of financial advising. Yeah. Or I can oh. change within the system of like the financial services that I was in, or I could just completely change directions in career, you know? Yeah. So I kind of hit that crossroad. I'm like, I could, you know, I go, go here, go there basically. So I had already said, I, I really love the practice. Like I, I enjoyed working with the clients. And so I'm like, I'm not going to change direction. So I got to, and, and then I started to talk to the, the big financial services company that I work for and quickly realized like no dice there. Like I'm not going to be able, it's going to take forever. It's going to be super slow. And so basically my only option was I got to completely leave the system and kind of like recreate things. And that's when I started my business. So that was 2014. I started my business. Uh, and so we also realized at that time, like physicians were going through very similar challenges and we're like, you know, this makes all the sense in the world to like focus on helping physicians uh, work through the same sort of challenges I had just worked through and really kind of pair up that financial literacy with addressing big life questions so that they could have the courage to ideally, you know, work through things like this. And, and ultimately it's about living a good life. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Uh, you know, it's so interesting. Um, you know, we could share so many different stories because um, like I said, 
you know, I got fed up with the healthcare system because it was making CEOs rich and then making doctors and staff and patients sicker and making the staff poor. So, um, and I'm sure that, you know, financials no different, you know, there's incentives to sell like high fee services and, and the whole system is rigged. So, um, you know, I, I love the work that you're doing and just kind of, um, you know, your story and your journey uh, resonates with so many different individuals. So, you know, kind of we'll, we'll talk about this, uh, you know, you work with physicians, you know, question is, one thing is, uh, why did you specifically focus on physicians as opposed to just kind of, um, you know, the broad audience, and then we'll talk about, um, you know, what is the number one frustration with physicians with the financial system? Yeah, I think, so we really have leaned into working with physicians over the years. Um, a lot of it is this similar similarity of the challenges. It's like the system and the frustration professionally and the finances as the tool to gain leverage and make scary changes. And then also, I really love like, you know, teaching and financial literacy is a big component as well. So as you, you know, I'm sure you know, like in the training system of healthcare, there's like zero financial literacy training, or maybe it's getting a little better now, like there's some. <laughs> and so it's like the the combination of those two things. It's like, I had a lot of similarities professionally, helping them through that big change, helping them to ultimately like aim, like have good solid aim, and then use the financial literacy as the tool, uh, as the, you know, the, the method to get, get where they want to go. Uh, it was, and I had already worked with physicians. So I was working in the financial product side of the game and, you know, physicians are big buyers of disability insurance. So that was one of the ways like we made money in the system, uh, by selling disability insurance. So I had the the privilege of working with a bunch of physician families there. And I'm like, you know, this is just, a, it's a great, uh, you know, niche to specialize in. And, and, and that was, it was a natural transition at that point. And that was 2014. Yeah. One thing uh, talking about is um, industry challenges. And um, it, like I said, um, there's uh, there's so much uh, misalignment and values, incentives. And so in your key, in your view, what are the key misalignments in the financial advisory and healthcare systems that impact physicians the most? Yeah. Okay. So there's two big ones. It goes back to the system. You got to look at follow the money. I'm sure you've heard that, like follow the money and you'll, you'll start to realize. So in the financial services world, uh, like 90, 95% of, of compensation or like where the money is made essentially is in managing investments and selling financial products. And if you're a young physician, it's more the products because you don't have the investments, you know? So if you're a young physician, it's like, the problem is there's a heavy focus on the products because the financial industry has to place these products in order to make money for it to all work. And if you're further along and you have wealth, it's the investments. They're very incentivized and tied to managing money and the more, the better, the more they get paid. Uh, so that, th you know, that's the way it's all going to work. The problem with all that for the end, customer, the physician, the client, is that that's like a tiny sliver of like good quality financial planning is like, I mean, the investments are important and the products are important, but like most people we work with have like a lot of different struggles. It's like, you know, I'm getting burned out in my job. Like this is stressful. Like, I, you know, I want to give money to charity. Like I want to pay off my debt. Those things actually are in direct conflict a lot of times with the way that most advisors are compensated. It's like, if I'm making 1% of your assets, how am I going to confidently tell you like, let's go take a chunk of your assets to pay off your student loans. Cause that that's a pay cut. Yeah. It's a misalignment of, of values. And then on the product side, if, if I'm getting paid to sell you more disability insurance or more life insurance, whatever, I'm never going to be like, get less. I'm always going to be like, get more. It's just people are, incentivized by money unfortunately i mean that's just the way people work yeah yeah it's, and this, it's just it's just human nature um right and the most dangerous and i was this unfortunately i was there but the most dangerous situation is when you have like convinced yourself that you're able to navigate that without being influenced yeah 
You know, it's quite interesting because I'm having a lot of guests such as yourself, you know, CFPs, financial advisors, they actually, which actually reminds me of a lot of the um, kind of self-employment model where they, um, they break free of the traditional model and they start developing their own niches for, for example, physicians or kind of because they don't agree with the values and the incentives of the traditional. So they want to actually do some good. So um, which is what you're doing there. You no, know, kind of moving on is um, this question is, um, you know, especially um, in the younger generation, what I've seen is um, they understand that a career is not going to be 60 years, it's going to be a portfolio career, it's going to be different skills, um, they may be applying those skills in different environments and in different institutions. And so they understand that. And so they're, they're, they're planning and preparing Kind of talk about the different, the generational differences, like the older physicians, the boomers fixing to retire, younger generation physicians, like just in medical school residency. Um, what are their different needs or kind of their similarities, differences? Um, mm -hmm. And then we'll we'll dive into that. Yeah. So we'll we'll just kind of go with the extremes, like late career, very established, we'll assume is one, and then the early career, like. Just getting started so the late career like you know assume you've got you've built wealth like you have wealth um typically like a big financial concern is like you know do i have enough like do i have enough and it's, it's interesting like that seems to be a pressing question well into when people have enough it's like on average people have they cross the line of having enough at least like from a financial professional my definition of them having enough like they still have it after a while they're like but what if you know but what if um so that that seems to be a pretty common question even for people that have like exceeded that that number of having plenty um so having enough is an important thing uh and and that kind of ties into turn turning the career off i guess and that's a challenge in itself it's like what's my identity so a lot of physicians are very like as you know like tied in like that is their identity I'm going to kind of jump into some solutions already just because it's applicable, but it's like, yeah. we really try to put a focus on like the big questions. I was saying like, it's about the financial literacy and the big questions. Some of the big questions that people really need to think about is like, what's my purpose in life? And it's like being a good physician is, is really important, but like most people, when you really peel back the layers, there's a lot more to it than that. And so the sooner you can think about like, what is my purpose in life? What is my ideal life? look like and how do i start taking steps to address that and and then thinking even if you're younger like when i retire like what is my new endeavor or how do i test drive that taking big long vacations is a good example it's like taking a three week vacation will give you a really good kind of hint at what it it feels like to retire uh, so identity thing that's a, that's a big deal and i think for the later career physicians their children or their family is always important. So they're thinking about like, how do I put my kids or even grandkids, like how do I set them up to be on the right track? How do I not spoil them? How do I take care of them, but not spoil them? That's always kind of the balance of things. And how do I myself, like I'm going to have, if I'm going to have, uh, make sure I have enough, then if I have plenty, then what do I do with the excess and charitable giving starts to come into play? Like, how do I, maybe I want to be helping uh, provide for another cause that's important to me. And then the younger physicians, there's, I guess there's a lot of, like the similarities are that having a good aim is important. Like having a good direction on what you want your life to become is always important. Mm -hmm. And financial literacy is always important. Yeah. But like the challenges are, are are very different. It's like I have debt, student loans. They're complicated. Forgiveness of student loans is super complicated. Uh, and cash flow, like as in I'm about maybe I've already had a big pay bump, but if not, I'm about to have a big pay increase. And so how how can I be responsible with that? I know I need to. I'm behind. Like my peers have already done the things. Like they have the house, and so I feel pressure to have a family, like I need to buy a house. So how much do I spend? How much should I get a car? Like I've been working hard for so long, I deserve, I mean, like sometimes that's built into the equation and, and it's like, how do I use this income stream that's gonna be coming in to really start to propel me in the right direction, but still have a good life, have fun, enjoy the money. The thing that's interesting is, um, you know, I talked to a lot of um, 
you know, a lot of uh, med students and early residents, they, they, you know, come to me and ask, you know, questions and a lot of them, because the boomer generation, they were, um, they were like, take out student loan debt, you'll be able to pay it off. And now the younger generations like, um, no, with inflation and taxes and debt, you know, I don't want to be in debt forever. I'm going to limit how much student loans I take. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to go to more affordable med school. They're all, they're all the same, you know, it's just different, um, brand names. And, you know, unless you're right, you graduate residency, you can practice. So, um, and they understand that. And, uh, you know, they're starting to save during med school, like, you know, like earlier on you, like med students were, were poor, like they took on debt, but now they're actually trying to save and, you know, dollar cost average. And, um, which is really interesting. Uh, and then what is really interesting is this new emerging class of digital assets. And I get a lot of questions from the younger. They're like, is Bitcoin safe? Is Ethereum safe? Uh, you know, the older generations like, no, this is a scam. This is a Ponzi. <laughs> so um, what, are you getting questions such as that in, in your client base? Again, this is not mm -hmm. um, financial advice. We're just we're just discussing, you know, topics yeah, and trends. <laughs> always, always good to throw that out there. Uh, but yeah, that comes up all the time. Um, <laughs> And I kind of like categorize that as in the realm of like the shiny objects. Not that it, yeah. like not all shiny objects are bad, yeah. but like it is, it, it usually is coming about as a result of like some hype, you know, like yeah, there's I some do. like excitement going on with it. So you have to be careful not to like get all hyped up in it and the motion drive the, the ship on it. Yeah. Um, and that, like I said, that's not to say it's bad. It's just like, you don't want to get all in on some because we've had people really go all in on it and we've had some clients get into big trouble with with crypto and yeah. scams and stuff like that tied to it and yeah. and especially when it's leveraged i mean you never you got to be super careful in fact probably avoid like leverage and shiny objects mixed together that's a it's a recipe for disaster yeah. uh and so anyway crypto and that sort of thing it's a new thing so you know you just I, our general like lean is to be cautious with it and same thing we would say about anything like education and is it super important financial literacy like understand the thing you're investing in and ease in like don't put your entire wealth in the thing that, that you're going to invest in but it's not like the evil like it's not evil like it's it has it's it's promising it's an interesting uh new thing that has a lot of promise and could be a valuable piece of of your portfolio, especially these people they work with, they got it a long time ago. Like it has become a valuable piece of their portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting because, um, you know, for physicians, you know, for average physicians, you know, you're going to do fine because you have a very high income. And as long as you invest it well and you're, you know, you're frugal and, you know, you, you watch your expenses, um, some, but people want to take a little bit more risk. I'm not, again, you don't want to go all in and lose everything because it's, it's very risky and that, you know, it's still a, a very, nascent industry. So there's a lot of bad actors and, you know, there's regulation and all these, um, you know, small portion, just kind of just have exposure, but like I said, not your entire <laughs> net worth. Yeah. That, that's just, that's just plain dumb in my opinion. Very interesting question. Look, how can people, I know you got a podcast. Um, how can people contact you, follow you, reach out to you, you know, check out the work that you do, et cetera. Yeah. So, uh, the podcast, is funny. It's for physicians. So you can, you can check that out that we, we do uh, weekly shows. Um, and it's, it's education specific to physicians, financial literacy, but also I think with the spin, what's unique about that is, uh, we focus more on using money as a tool, not to get necessarily just rich, but to like live a more fulfilling life. Um, so I think that's important. Um, uh, and as far as reaching out, um, I think I'm happy to, especially if you have questions, like feel free to email me. You can email me at Daniel at finance for physicians.co. And I can, I love the questions cause we, it's great for like, we can do a podcast on it if it's a little bit more in depth question. And if it's not, I, I'm, I love just, you know, email and a response. It's, it's, it's a great way to kind of add a little value for people here and there. So feel free to reach out that way as well. Yeah. And for all the listeners out there, let's thank Daniel for coming on. Um, check out his podcast, check out his socials. All of these will be in the links in the show notes. Be sure to give him a follow, subscribe, like, share, comment, etc. And with that, thanks so much for coming on to the podcast. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Chris.